Welcome to the party. I'm Sam Ekstrom of Locked On Sports Minnesota. Regression finally catches up to your Minnesota Vikings. I'm Luke Braun of Locked On Vikings, and hey, at least we're not Bears fans. <laughs> hey, this is Arif Hassan of the Wide Left Substack, and we're big in the Doomsday Prepper community. <laughs> All that. And plenty more on today's Minnesota football party. Locked on Sports Minnesota podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. It's time for the Minnesota football party. Welcome into a new week of the Minnesota football party on Locked on Sports Minnesota. You've met Arif Hassan. You've met Luke Braun. I'm Sam Ekstrom. Thanks so much for watching and listening today, whether it's on YouTube, wherever you get your podcast, Sirius XM, Amazon Fire, Roku, so many ways to consume the content. A uh, little programming note as well on the Minnesota football party. Our audio that you've typically found on Locked on Sports Minnesota audio feeds now available on the Locked On Vikings audio feed that Luke Braun runs. So, Luke Braun, you are getting our audio, and I'm sure you are very thrilled about that for your audience. That's that that's going to be great. I think Locked On Vikings, if you include postcasts, is now up to eight things that go out a week, not including stuff that comes from the national network, like Ultimate Previews and stuff like that. Um, That's awesome. Uh, so check it out on the audio, and we'll announce that over and over again. I'm sure people will ask, where's the audio? Locked mm -hmm. on Vikings feed. Um, today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook partner of Locked On. Make every moment more at fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. And uh, our FanDuel wagers, gentlemen, we'll get to this later in the show, went <laughs> swimmingly <laughs> in week one. You can tell by my tone, they did not at all but we've got more pressing matters the vikings are own one we'll have our biggest overreactions from the defeat as well as no deal for justin jefferson which casts a little bit of a pall over the whole thing as well i uh, will talk about what we learned offensively defensively and we'll sprinkle in some nerdy stats of the day uh week one edition we begin with overreactions the vikings are own one they lose 20 to 17 to the tampa bay bucks how are you, Arif Hassan, overreacting to this game? Uh, I think the best overreaction is that the offensive line is doomed. There is no protection for Cousins, the most hit quarterback in the NFL last year. I believe, besides Daniel Jones, was the most hit quarterback in the NFL this last week. Uh, I could be wrong about that. Maybe I just made that up. But I was looking at a bunch of quarterback hit stats. It was pretty bad. Uh, so the obvious of a reaction is that the Vikings did nothing to uh, improve their offensive line, and they are now reaping the benefits of their resource misallocation. They only have $4 million in cap space. Where should they have taken it from? I don't know. That's not what the segment is about. <laughs> uh, Garrett Bradbury, back injury, Christian Derrissa, ankle injury to make matters worse. Luke Braun. Uh, oops, Brian Flores' defense doesn't work. When you blitz a whole bunch and then you play off man coverage and you backpedal guys 14 yards off, it turns out you give up 10 yard outs on third and 10. Whoops. That's an incredibly bad faith way to put it. That's but if we're overreacting, awful. That's yeah, if the, we're uh, overreacting, I get it, but that is awful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's bad on purpose. It's not clearly not that bad, but I do think they need, they should make uh, an adjustment in terms of their alignment depths, uh, to, Try try to curb that a little bit because there were too many people open quickly that allowed Baker Mayfield to get rid of the ball, not just on dump offs, but to actual productive throws before yeah. free rushers got there. That can't ha that's like crucial to the Brian Flores blitz 42 percent of the time thing working is that there isn't a guy open at the top of the drop back. And we'll, we'll dig into this plenty more. But it, I saw the Seifert tweet, and we're still waiting on PFF. I don't know if, Arif, you seem to have these things before anyone else. Maybe you can shed light on it. But I, I saw 47% blitz rate from Seifert. Um, and it felt to me, like, after, like early in the second half, after it didn't work a couple times, Flores actually dialed it back a lot and still didn't seem to be effective in coverage. Um, but my overreaction is, man, they really don't like Brian Asamoah. And even more surprising, they don't seem to like Tonga that much. I thought Tonga was a starter all training camp. And then suddenly Jonathan Bullard is the guy um, on that line, along with Lowry, 
along with uh, Phillips. And other than Phillips, who I felt like like made some spot splashy plays, not a lot from the interior. Um, but the snap count allocation was very interesting. And Ivan Pace, Ivan Pace, Pace. forty six snaps in the game, Asamoa two. Um, so that is definitely telling <laughs> about where they're at with Asamoa, Asamoa, however we're going at it. But it felt like 2021 all over again. You couldn't defend in the final two minutes, and you shot yourself in the foot offensively, and you lost a close game. The Vikings are – And you lost a close game. The Vikings are 0-1 in one-possession games, infinitely worse than last year where they did not – So lose. they are 0 to win, right? That's how this works? They're due. They're due. Yep. And They're they outgained the other team. So actually, this was a fraudulent loss. Vikings are fine. <laughs> the Vikings are frauds. They're actually winners. Yeah. Could, fraudulent could, losers. Could you could you spin it that way that the Vikings offense Easily. was productive enough that if they do what they did, sands the turnovers, that this is going to be an explosive offense? Arif, can you talk yourself into that? Uh, yeah, it doesn't take much. The Vikings had a far better success rate. They massively outgained the Buccaneers in yards per play. They outgained the Buccaneers in total yards. Uh, they were better on third down. Um, they, they were a better team. Actually, right after the game, a Bucks reporter reached out to me and they were like, hey, so, you know, watching this game, it feels like it feels like if the Buccaneers and Vikings played each other again 10 times and the Vikings would win. Uh, probably the majority seven or eight of those times. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's the feeling I get. But, you know, obviously to Vikings fans, the one that counts is this game. But in terms of projecting forward from this game, I think there's actually a little bit more to be happy about than sad about. And maybe that's just like my, my biases from last season showing. I think that the offense was, um, you know, not, not in sync, but I just have less concern about the state of the offense overall going forward than I do about the state of the defense and the defense to me showed up. Yeah. There are some schematic wrinkles that need to be cleaned up, but I think overall they did a really great job limiting the total production. I think if you cap EPA for turnovers, which is to say, take a look at the most sustainable factors in terms of projecting success going forward, something that Kevin Cole does over the unexpected point Substack. stack. Uh, he uses something called adjusted score to tell us kind of what the performance projects to over the course of a series of games. The Vikings have a projected score of 22 to 20. That's not to say that the Vikings should feel better about themselves, but I think Vikings fans should not treat this loss as an example that the Vikings are catastrophically doomed or that, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they, they just had a rabbit's foot and that's it last season. There were some bones there to build off of last season and we're seeing, you know, some of the repercussions of regression, you know, kind of hitting them this year. But I thought that there was, there was a lot to work with. Ron, we were both, I think pretty frustrated during the postcast yesterday you can also find that audio on Locked on Vikings or on, on Locked on Sports Minnesota. Uh, and Ron Johnson, too. We were all frustrated after the game. What All three phases at various points let the team down. Would you say that you've calmed down in the 24 hours since, or are you more frustrated than yesterday? I mean, always. It's kind of the draw of the postcast is that you get the like highest emotional <laughs> moment right yeah. after the game comes in. Um, that's kind of the beauty of a week to week sport like football is that the next game starts zero zero, no matter how mad you are. They play on Thursday next game. Um, th that's like where I'm at emotionally, but in terms of trying to take what I can from this game, learn what I can about the Vikings. Um, I think, yeah, if you look at it, it's look, don't fumble and you win, right? That's a pretty easy yeah. note to employ. <laughs> don't fumble and you, and you win this game. They did fumble, so they don't get to win this game, right? Just like last year, I said, hey, yeah, they did all these unsustained. They're not supposed to be able to win all of those close games, but they did, though. In this one, it's, well, maybe they weren't supposed to lose this game, right, but right. they you, did, you, though. You got, to in, you got to enjoy those wins while understanding what the reality of those wins are. You can hold both of those thoughts in your head at the same time. Same thing. You get to be frustrated at this loss, yeah. but you also understand kind of the reality of the loss as well. Do, do exactly. you guys realize this is the first time we've been in this situation in the Kevin O'Connell era because all four losses in the regular season last year were so decisive that 
we, we never really talked about, oh, how do we make adjustments from this to the next game? To flip yeah, this, you should like, burn the tape loss. after Dallas. It was yeah. We had four, <laughs> basically four burn the tape losses, and then the playoff loss. It was just over, right? There was no adjustment right. to be There's made no after that. Yeah. So this is the first time we've actually had to talk about a game, kind of you know hinging on a couple of different plays and going the wrong way for the Vikings, twenty to seventeen, the final score. Um, what of of the many things stuck in your craw, Bron? What bugged you the most? about about the way that game went there was something up front and i i was musing about it on locked on vikings today about like okay what do we do about kirk cousins getting hit so much do we fire someone and i don't actually think that that makes the problem any better um because i think it was more about the way that they handled stunts which is like what yes. todd Bowles Entirely. does yeah like if you watch any bucks tape preseason last year. I don't care. You will see tons and tons and tons of crashing and looping. Not unlike us, right? Uh, and you still had offensive linemen carrying those crashing linemen way too deep into the next guy. You have to be, find a way to pass those things off, whether that's that, calling that's different protections, or whether that's sack. approaching your man. Yeah. That's what happened on the, on the strip sack. Um, whether that's approaching something differently. I think they came out with a game plan that was not prepared adequately to handle stunts. And I think that that's a really, really bad mistake that they cannot make again. So, so my question to that is um, sometimes you just have players that are not equipped at an NFL level to deal with that, right? You can coach players to be better at stunts for sure. Some players cannot be coached to be better at stunts. It would be surprising to me if the Vikings did not enter this game with a game plan that took into account the fact that Todd Bowles defenses stunt a lot. And to me, the primary concern was Ed Ingram, like in terms of the ability to get off of his man to man assignment in a slide. So he doesn't even have a man to man assignment, uh, get off of his blocker in order to readjust to blocking his area. His awareness has persistently been an issue with the Vikings, and I don't know. And this has nothing to do with the body control stuff. This has nothing to do with causing fumbles with his arm or, or tripping Kirk Cousins with his leg. It seems like he does a poor job picking up stunts, twists, blitzes, anything. And so at what point do you just say, I don't know if this is a coaching problem? So it's it's. Interesting because there's a, a couple different ways to approach it with this. If you are in a slide, yeah, you're supposed to pass that guy off. It's like similar to zone coverage, right? Don't carry yeah. your guy so far so that you're out of your zone. When you when it is a man protection, which is what it was on, for example, the Winfield block, it was fan protection because they were sending too many guys. So we had to go into just big on big, get a get a guy on a guy. Um, you're not supposed to come off of that, but there are adjustments you can make in your game plan that say, hey, when we're in man to man, we can do that you just have to be comfortable and trust that the guy next to you is going to be able to pick them up which you have to know via tape study and also just trusting your teammate which in that particular which situation Austin is Schlotman a, was a backup that just came into the game yeah um so all of that stuff is a consideration not to say that it secretly was a good job or anything like that but when you're talking about okay how do we solve this issue um I think that there are paces you can go through that are okay let's you know try to be a little bit more aggressive in terms of preempting when somebody crashes pass him off um let's try to stay in our jet protections more often which is like half slides um or or even full slide protections more often let's try to do that kind of stuff that would be the the conversation that i would if i had to guess what conversation they're actually having right now that would be the one that i would guess um I'm sure that they, you know, watched tape and knew that there would be stunts, right. but whatever they came up with didn't work. So uh, that's an L and you got to chalk that one up in the bad column and try again. The Bucks produced nine quarterback hits per ESPN. Vikings produced two and the Vikings blitzed 47% of the time. The Bucks uh, blitzed 42% of the time per Seifert. So they tried very hard to get after Kirk Cousins. Um, and Kirk fumbles once. And then the pick was not 
due to pressure at all. So one turnover that they produced and I believe two sacks on Kirk um, as a result of that pressure. Um, I was pretty irritated that the Vikings couldn't run the ball again. I know that, you know, never run. That's that's is the mentality. Like you just got to pass the ball and that's fine. But I was bugged. I was bugged that they couldn't run the ball again. And they tried Chandler. They tried Madison. Got occasionally they got some tough yards, but nothing explosive. Um, it seemed like again getting blown up sometimes. Nowhere to go. Negative plays from the one yard line. That's stupid. Uh, that bugged me. That bugged me. And I don't think Miles Gaskin played either. So again, you've got. <laughs> You've it looked a lot like last year, where you've got this kind of bell cow roll guy, and it was Madison yesterday, not doing much, and then you spell him occasionally, and he didn't do much, and no one got in a rhythm, and it was all on the passing game once again, and it was a good passing game until the very very end, where the Vikings go three and out twice in the fourth quarter. Um, I've got a nerdy stat of the day revolving around this. So why don't we just pivot to that and do a little nerdy stat? Analytics fans rejoice. It's time to get educated. Whoa, you're blowing my mind right now. With the nerdy stat of the day. And I'll keep you waiting just a moment longer as I tell you about FanDuel Sportsbook and these great promotions going on at FanDuel.com slash locked on. Uh, if you weren't in the action yesterday at FanDuel, that's fine. You can join now. New customers can bet $5 at FanDuel and get $200 in bonus bets straight to your account. You can put it on week two games. You can bet uh, Major League Baseball. You can bet the Ryder Cup when it comes along. There's so many ways to wager at FanDuel.com slash locked on the easy to use FanDuel Sportsbook app. And the, the reviews were rave about NFL Sunday Ticket in week one. People loving the new four box on YouTube TV for NFL Sunday Ticket. So if you bet five, you can get $100 off the all new NFL Sunday Ticket on YouTube and YouTube TV. Check out those great promotions at the very popular America's number one sportsbook, FanDuel. Sportsbook app and FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel is an official partner of the National Football League. All right, nerdy stat of the day from me. The Vikings were killing the Bucks on first down through the air, killing them. First 13 times they tried to throw on first down, they produced 10.8 yards per play. Um, Cousins was 10 of 13 in those situations. Running the ball on first down, miserable. 22 yards, nine attempts, 2.4 yards per carry. So it made sense that the Vikings would go to the air on first and 10, on their most critical drives of the game. And what did they produce? Two tight end screens that went for minus three and minus four when it mattered. They were dominating the Bucks on first down through the first 13 reps, and then it all went south for the Vikings offense. But for those that are saying, well, you can't be so inefficient on first down, you got to get some yards, you got to you know be able to run the ball there. I think the Vikings did the right thing. I think the Bucks just took away plays in the most critical part of the game but i think the viking the, the passing game was really terrific i thought for the first three quarters um and then to slow down when it mattered very antithetical to 2022 that's my nerdy stat of the day uh arif Hassan, what do you got uh, i mean i went over them uh already right you know the vikings in adjusted score uh mm -hmm. 22 to 20 again adjusted score is a metric designed to reduce the unstable indicators from game to game that have a big outcome on the actual score the ones that matter the ones that count and project going forward i mean again the vikings outgained uh i want to say what 5.8 something like that 5.9 yards per play to 3.81 that they allowed in yards per play i mean the vikings statistically have a very strong case for being a pretty good team, not a great team, but a pretty good team based off of just week one. Um, I don't expect Ed Ingram to cause many fumbles going forward. And honestly, I don't expect Kirk Cousins' ball placement to induce more interceptions, at least along those lines on a consistent basis going forward. So, I mean, on a, on a cap DPA perspective, the Vikings were actually one of the better teams. In fact, the Vikings are the only team to have a loss while also projecting 
over six and a half adjusted net yards per attempt. That is uh, yards per attempt that takes into account sacks, provides a penalty for interceptions, and a bonus for passing touchdowns. Hmm. Very interesting. And by the way, I want to give Luke Braun a shout out. Luke Braun on X at Luke Braun NFL. Great breakdown of the interception that Kirk Cousins threw uh, that right. you can watch and consume for free on X. Uh, Luke, nerdy stats. Uh, so you guys saw the 49ers Pittsburgh game, or at least heard about that one. 30 to 7. That one Steelers was rough. fans. Uh, inconsolable Steelers fans are. I was had... right about Kenny Pickett. That much like Bears fans, they had talked themselves into some stuff beautiful that didn't preseason. bear out. A beautiful preseason. One of the greatest <laughs> preseasons we've ever seen. Almost not an exaggeration. <laughs> <laughs> so in that game, San Francisco by uh, yards per play outgained the Pittsburgh Steelers 5.9 to 3.9 by a full two yards per play. 30 to 7 victory. The Vikings outgained the Buccaneers with the exact same yards per play of 5.9. And Tampa Bay only had 3.6. They actually outgained the Bucs by more than the 49ers outgained the Steelers by. Don't fumble. Don't fumble and you win the game. That's that's it. Just don't fumble. Well, also, Change nothing else. On. Also, and you and you probably win by two scores if you don't fumble. Yeah. And don't throw those picks. You two red zone interceptions. The Vikings also did not recover their own fumbles. Fumble luck. This yeah. fumble luck also played a role here. Yeah. No fumble, but also at least recover one of them. Jesus. And and the bounce too that you know wound up in Izzy's arms off of Osborne. That's pretty lucky too. That was kind of a oh look what I Honest, found here. Honestly, are we calling that a drop? Tricky. By the way, because he said KJ Osborne, Osborne, Osborne said after the game that he never had it really, yeah. and that was on the body. <laughs> it was ah, uh, but. It was not it was in behind the frame. him a little bit, but Cousins said he did that frame. on purpose, and I think I think that's a reasonable one to expect for an NFL wide. I I would expect I it I as well. It, but... I would also expect so, PFF well, to not attribute one. Yeah, so, yeah well, uh, the way they like that stat companies attribute drops is a lot stingier than I think we did. Very stingy. Um, yeah. What was the because um, what Mahomes dealt with drop after drop after drop right against the, yeah. the Lions. PFF only logged three official drop or official. Yeah. Logged and only two drops. to Tony, which yeah. Tony so, pretty clearly had three in that game. Yeah. So, I mean, it's if it's contested at all, it's usually mm-hmm. almost never a drop. Um, so the thing is, like, I think that most NFL receivers with that ball placement, with the momentum that they have, catch that if there's not a defensive back there. That to me is not the defining feature of whether or not something is a drop. And also, I don't want to argue with Osborne about whether, I mean, he could be lying. I don't know. But I, I don't think he is with uh, him not thinking that he had caught it. Because I think for a player to think that they've caught it, they have to have some level of control over it. Um, which is not to say that everything that gets plucked out of your hands is not a catch. But rather, at the moment that that happened, he didn't have control over the ball. You know, if it gets ripped out later, that's a catch. You know, whatever, right? But... um I, I would argue that that's an area where he is still attempting to bring the ball in and someone else brought the ball in. That'd be like saying that on that on that fourth and 18 that Jefferson caught, that Cam Lewis caught it and Jefferson pulled it out of his hands. He never had control. It just looked like he was about to have control. Are there any particular players or coaches that really have egg on their face? After this one, I think Ed Ingram's, you know, right hand or left hand, uh, that that's a big blunder. But are you like Matt Daniels, for instance, his special teams weren't weren't incredible in this game. Are you are you putting the microscope on him at all or anyone else? Uh, I'm I'm going to give it a little to Kevin O'Connell for all offseason hyping the hell out of Brian Osama only to not play him at all. I mean, they were like very publicly they were going like, in. we really yeah. like unprompted too like we really like this guy then ah no nah, but he didn't really get a lot of snaps in the preseason and, he's still dealing with that shoulder injury and and he got his own like press availability we'll put troy die in more yeah he got his own press availability uh in between like uh you know before training camp right he had the the podium right sorry the lectern uh he had the podium and uh 
and and he was talking about like you know the, he's seeing the game really quickly and recognizing things and then hey when you see a guard do this you got to do this and and people were t- and and the Vikings put him there and then he mm-hmm. does that and then people talk up like his awareness and recognition and it's like okay if you put a guy in that spot that's come on <laughs> I, I I gotta say too the vibes got really weird around around Asimov like early August. So there was one day. I, I love that we've convinced Sam to talk about vibes. This is great. This is a huge It's, it's a new word I learned. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> there was, important. there yeah. was a day where Pace got reps with the ones over Asimov and he was still healthy at this point. And he seemed really irked. Like he was pushing after the whistle. He was irritated. He was surly this day. Surly. So then, then the next day, but not the, quite in, furious. The next day he's in uniform but he's not doing anything and, but he wasn't rehabbing. So it was like, what's going on here? Why is he like, why is he here? But doing nothing is this, is it injury related? If it's injury related, why is he here? Not rehabbing. And then that injury just lingered and lingered. And I, I don't know what, what all happened there, but it was a kind of an ambiguous timeline on the injury. And they're using that injury too, seemingly as, as like evidence as to why he's not playing more because he missed all those reps, but he took a lot of reps before that in the summer. He was at practice taking a mentally like, I don't know. That's, that's a kind of an odd rationale as to why this like supposedly prized linebacker isn't in there. Unless Ivan Pace is just really, 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 really good. If he's like really, really, really good. I would have, I would have liked to see a bigger impact. (laughs) Um, It's just game one. And I'm totally willing to entertain uh, the notion that this guy is better than Asimov. But like, you know, he hasn't done anything yet. Um, Grades are available. PFF. What do you want to know first? Oh, my God. They finally put him out. Uh, First of all, the first thing I want to know is why it took so long. Yeah. Come on, PFF. What's going on? 11 (laughs) a.m. next day. What Uh, what are my opinions? I don't know yet. (laughs) (laughs) Now we can really break down the game. Uh, Ed Ingram, Ed Ingram allowed the most pressures for Christian Derrissaw, three, Schlopman, two, um, total pressures allowed 12. I want to look at the, the quarterback play under pressure though. So cousins, the, uh, the the time to throw in blitzed. Do we have that? Yeah, we'll get from Baker. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yep. We'll get there Uh, for sure. I'll, I'll do uh, I'll, I'll look it up for Baker. Yeah. All right, Cousins under pressure was bro, six bro, of bro, eleven. Bro. Six of eleven with a fumble. Play action. Sixteen play action dropbacks. He was fine. Six point six yards per attempt. Nothing, nothing too special there. I so, my uh, hunch, my hunch is that the pass rush was really miserable in this game. Um I don't feel that. Um the base pass rush was pretty mis like the Hunter yeah, with Neil Hunter three. had what is two and then jo- the, like Jones with anything? two. Whitley had one uh, snap and one like <laughs> hurdle. So Benton great. Whitley. <laughs> yeah, that was so great. Uh, so continuing okay, so his Mayfield... preseason trend of getting really, really close to getting sacks, but finding yeah, more, oh, more it's entertaining perfect. ways it was, not it was to get perfect. sacks. Yeah, I, I it's I don't even know how he can top that. Guy's um, got a brand. So, I love it. <laughs> so Baker Mayfield was under pressure on 23.7% of dropbacks, which is a pretty low percentile pressure rate to generate. Um, you asked for time to throw wind blitz. So PFF has a different blitz rate than ESPN. Don't know necessarily why that would uh, appear. It may have something to do with um, with the way simulated pressures are calculated. Um, 55.3% blitz rate for PFF for Baker Mayfield. And maybe ESPN counts plays that are penalized and PFF doesn't or vice versa, right? Time to throw when blitzed 2.37 seconds. That's pretty fast. That's pretty fast. Bucks just handled the blitz. I mean, he was blitzed. Not a lot of time for someone to get open, huh? 21 times (laughs) and pressured nine. Adjusted and... accuracy rate when blitzed, 75%, but completion rate when blitzed, 57.9%. Um, coverage grades, no one... Oh, wait, this is what that implies, right? No one what? especially liable in coverage. Sorry. It, it implies that when the Vikings blitz, somehow that causes receiver drops. 
or throwaways because adjusted or throwaways accuracy yeah. is like taking throwaways yeah, get, and yeah, spikes and stuff out. yeah yeah so it just but, means that he was like dirting the play which that works uh, but it, it does have one it only lists one throwaway and one drop so maybe hmm. maybe it's both does it count as a throwaway if it's like a screen and they like throw it at the guy's ankles because the screen's going to be blown up do they chart that as a throwaway i believe they do DJ Wanham got good grades in this game. Cam Bynum got good yards. grades. 6.0 yards per attempt. Bynum had a game. When, yeah, Bynum did have a very good game. 6.0 yards per attempt when blitzed. Overall, that's not bad. I don't know. I'm, I'm not upset with these performance under blitz numbers. I think that these grades so far support my theory that there's not a lot of individuals that have a lot of egg on their face. It was sort of a, t- a team failure where you didn't have enough big plays um, and obviously some some kind of random poor executions. Brian O'Neill, though, very good. Ezra Cleveland, pretty good in the pass blocking game. I like to see that. Um, one more thing I want to check on, rushing. So Ivan Pace ended up with a 75 PFF grade. A lot of that comes from blitzing but you know that's not that seven did at cincinnati too i mean yeah I mean, it's you know if it works right it's a living <laughs> cousins I've made one big time throw dinosaur. i wonder what his big time throw was uh probably to jordan addison yeah i guess i don't know i, I don't know if they're correct because he was open on the play but it was also a very good throw very accurate big touchdown um, throw they usually give that right yeah uh, so big time throws are almost always typically uh in accurate deep throw they don't really account for um like ah this was a killer ball placement over the middle if it's like a 19 yard third down which i would consider to be a stunning throw right if you fit a super like Mm -hmm. Trevor Lawrence had a couple of those yesterday where if you fit a super tight window, you get through the arms of a couple of defenders over the middle, but it's 19 yards instead of 20. I don't think PFF counts that as a big time throw. I think it's literally just another way to do adjusted percentage for deep ball accuracy. A Caleb Evans also two of six, his receivers were in uh, when targeted. That's not bad. Um, Caleb Evans, I thought was all right. Yeah, again, it was really spread around. It was kind of death by a thousand cuts there in the second half where they just the Bucks just did enough and Godwin made an made an amazing catch. Now, if Godwin doesn't make the catch to, to clinch the game, um Todd Bowles would have been in, in Dan Campbell territory. Like I was thinking back to week three last year Dan when Campbell Camp- territory. Yeah, oh, so Campbell, are you saying going for it on that fourth I, and ten? Gamble oh, Campbell okay. gambled. Dan um, well, no. Gamble. Campbell went for a field goal up three and missed. Gave the Vikings a short field. Bowles would have been in position to try another (laughs) 57-yard field goal, goal, if that's incomplete, 57-yard field goal to go up six with, uh, was it two minutes at that point? Two minutes. But considering you're the road team in Minnesota, you can guarantee that that's going in. They'll make the field goal, yeah. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about, like, the probabilities are different, you know? Yeah. Which might be good. Historic. When you're the team that's down six, forced to score, I feel like that usually works out for the team uh, so trying his, to score the touchdown. Historically, yeah, there's like a, an actual thing about that, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Historically, um, it is worse to be down one, two, or three points than it is to be four, five, or six points. Which is insane and tells us a lot about the way that teams prioritize uh, mm-hmm. play calling at end of half drives. But yeah, yeah. Um, do we think the Vikings win that game if Marcus Davenport is healthy? Okay, let's talk about that because I didn't like the pass rush going in. I didn't like the depth at all going Mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And then with Davenport out, freaky ankle injury on a Friday, that sucks. Um, And I've been so bullish on Davenport too. I thought he was going to be good. I thought he was going to be effective. And now that's all put into question. But I catastrophic framing for like a one game <laughs> absence well this i thought just... he was going to be good rips <laughs> rips to a real one He's it's dead. just it's it's just <laughs> confirmation <laughs> as to why Cancel the season. saints had so much trouble getting him on the field for more than 40 snaps a game 30 snaps a game um i think that they were 
you know, maybe one one big play away from swinging that game early on. It, I think it's easy to make that argument for like anything when you lose by a field goal, right? Yeah. So sure. Yeah. But they lost because of turnovers. <laughs> That's why I made it. <laughs> and Davenport doesn't do anything about the turnovers. They lost because they were 0 and 3 in the turnover battle. But also, right. but also but maybe they would have been 1 and 3 in the turnover battle. Or maybe there would have been a third yeah. down they didn't convert. I'm just saying. H- hence but- why I said sure. As much as you can make that for any argument, right? Yeah, I'm right. Okay. It was 10. <laughs> it was 10 10 at the time of the Vikings final turnover. So you had a half where you were turnover free. And where it the could Bucks... have been 24 to 10 and over. Yeah. You're right. You yeah. are right. You are right. If you, it was 10 3 just before half, right? And if you could affect Baker Mayfield on that drive where he hits Mike Evans for the TD. If you go in 10-3 at half, I like your chances a lot. Well, okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about the interception because we talked about the fumbles a little bit. Braun, I haven't seen uh, your breakdown of it. Um, so my read of the interception, right, is that you throw it behind the receiver because there's a lurking safety on top. Cousin said that basically after the game, that that is a fairly typical practice. But you do have that defensive back. Like, if you take a look at uh, a, a slightly different angle, it's, you know, it's whatever – that that safety is further away than Izian is, right? And so to me, mm-hmm. you leverage, you don't throw it in front. Of, the last thing you do is throw it in front of Osborne. I think you're right to err on the side of throwing it further behind him. But to me, that pass has to be directly on the frame, of, which is a tough throw. I'm asking a lot, but it's the red zone. Those are tight windows. It's um, it's a tight window. That's yeah. what I said in the clip is it has to be like dead, like put it between the numbers and he put it. Yes. Behind. Okay. Okay. Um, and O'Connell said after the game too, that he didn't like the ball placement on that one, but I do think it's like okay. genuinely kind of debatable. Cause I see the argument for no throw it behind. Cause that safety is going to, going to poach it. Um, and the safety, ultimately the is if like Osborne two yards away relative, like Izian's right there. Like, like that's... if he makes that catch cleanly and it doesn't bounce around, then there's no interception opportunity. So like I can see the argument for that ball placement being fine. I think it could have been optimized more, but that it, it, we're talking about a couple of inches, you know, so it's never going to be that the NFL is. I, <laughs> I, I know, I know, yeah, but yeah. you know, it's not, wow, what a miss, right? It's like, okay, we could optimize so that a little bit. The, it's a different thing. Critique. The thing I want to get at then is because I'm, I'm asking a lot for a quarterback to process the relative distances 20 yards downfield of a safety and a quarterback for a receiver while everything is in motion. I get that. Um, but the thing I want to kind of get at is that I think that this is kind of an example of the textbook approach that Cousins takes to playing quarterback that works out 90 percent of the time, but doesn't work in situations where there are just slight differences in terms of the way that you would describe it on a piece of paper versus what's happening on the field. Because again, you're throwing into uh, an in-breaking route. You want to throw away from the lurking defender up top. That is tech. That's exactly what you do, right? That's teach tape, right? Um, But the nature of the relative positions of these players uh, was a little bit different, even if the coverage that was called would suggest you throw it behind. And that's kind of what I want to get at is that like, this feels like an example where cousins did the thing that you would do when you've got that route against the way you would describe that coverage versus the way it physically appeared on the field. Let's go back in time to a couple plays. I think they made a mistake, not calling timeout after the 42 yard Jefferson catch and run. And wasted 20 seconds, all in the name of saving your second timeout, not your final timeout, your second timeout. I'm fine with it. I, yeah. They were, yeah, taking end zone shots with like 20 seconds to go. That's, that's you, you, the amount of time. It, it I don't takes know. a lot. Yeah. It, it exactly. may have encouraged him to push the ball more than he wanted to. And, and I think he said after he like felt it was too aggressive, which I super disagree with. I think that that was a fine decision. Just 20 seconds left in the game, you're throwing at the goal line. That's good. Yep. Um, but, but I if you have like if they had if you have 43 40 seconds, seconds, it would have had right, 43 seconds is, instead of 20. Like, all it would have done is encourage him to make a decision I feel like is worse in that moment. <laughs> right. Okay. But, but Sam, so like obviously you call the timeout, you give yourself the option to run the ball once, right? Because you only have one more timeout after that. 
Um, and and you don't like you don't know if that run's gonna be successful. First, I the running game was not that great. I don't know if I'm preserving timeouts to preserve the run. Maybe you feel like you can preserve or the middle of the field. Bit. Middle of the field um, pass too. Sure, but the, like you have that anyway, because uh even though it's it's 22 seconds, something like that, 21, 22 seconds. Um Passes are fast. That's just what the NFL like. Passes happen very quickly. You have two timeouts and you can throw it over the middle of the field and then call that timeout. Right. Like, so I think that having 20 seconds, if you're near the goal line, like if, if they end up at the, at the 50 or even, or even at the opponent's 40, I think you probably call that timeout. But I think when you're near the goal line, you just don't need that much time to score. I think it is more likely in that scenario, if you call that timeout, that you're preserving time for the other team if they get lucky with the play to create a field goal opportunity. And that and you and are that preserving plays for yourself. Yep. There is a fine line where you want to try to score with nothing on the clock or as close yeah. to that as possible. I get that. I totally get that. Uh, we got to talk about Justin Jefferson's contract before this show is over. Uh, right. Make sure that you are checking out the Sirius XM app, the SXM app for all the Locked On Sports Minnesota content. Also find Twins games there. Twins Rays tonight, 6.40 p.m. Get the local hometown broadcast on the SXM app. Just search Twins or hear our show. Search Locked On Sports Minnesota. Uh, we got the news Saturday. Justin Jefferson's contract will not get done, and they will revisit after the season. Uh, downplayed by Jefferson for the most part, but it's hard for me not to view this as an issue. It may not be verbalized as an issue, but I think it's going to lead to certainly some distractions or misinterpretations. There's already been misinterpretations. Oh, there's lots of misinterpretations. Je Jefferson, he's a Bengal Je baby. <laughs> he's being photoshopped with Jamar Chase. Yeah, exactly. he snapped at Cousins after it's over. He did, he's so on, mad on a third you can tell down. by him by his answer in the locker room that said the exact opposite of that. Well, only people upset who on are very mad try as, as hard as possible to not be mad. So and it, there are it, it does a lot prove. Of, yeah, there's a lot of people. I, I think it was Kevin Seifert that that tweeted out his quote that was I, like, I, "Man, I don't care anymore. We're in the season." Like that's what he basically said. Like there are right. football so, games. Who cares about Seifert's this now? initial tweet before he tweets out the actual quotes. Um, I I don't think Seifert understood the way it would come across, and that I think accelerated things because it kind of said because his initial yeah, tweet was it was very like <laughs> he's because he, he's because he said something like adamant the whole time he's like I do not care that is yeah my it's whatever thing and which is I'm which here is, to get endorsements I'm doing sleep number ads and catching touchdowns that's what I do I'm just right, which is a, which is a totally fine approach specifically for Justin Jefferson to take because he has so much more leverage than any other player in the league right now because he is the most yeah. marketable player in the league like period it's like him and then Mahomes right and maybe I'm biased because I'm in Minnesota but like his endorsement deals are crazy he is super charismatic he is everywhere in fact if you take a look at the nfl top 100 announcements right they've got they've got an individual video for each player in the top 10 on youtube jefferson clears in terms of view count he j mm. it's not close right mm. he's he just kids love him and they should he rules but like he's got so much negotiating leverage that he is fine like that is why i think that's the bigger reason uh, as to why he and his agent didn't feel the need to have kind of a, a holdout of versus TJ Hawkinson and Daniel Hunter that plus there is everyone's forgetting. There's another year left on his deal. There just is. And then on and top of that, the, it, and then you can tag him. Exactly. Um, in fact, you could tag him twice. Like it's yeah. the Vikings it would be have, justifiable. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like that. He's the one of the few players. And I guess Kirk cousins is another one that you can tag <laughs> multiple times and be comfortable <laughs> with it in terms of the amount it costs you. Now, of course, tagging multiple times results in immediate cap hit versus the way deals are structured that gives you more flex. Fine. But Jefferson is going to get money. That's it. Like, and so he's fine on that front. The Vikings are fine in terms of the amount of control that they have. If I were another player or if I played for another team, right? If if I'm playing for the Bengals, T. Higgins, and I know that they have a lot of difficulty with cash flow and they just exhausted all of that with Joe Burrow, I would be a little bit more concerned. But the Vikings don't have a cash flow problem. They can guarantee all of that money up front. 
it's fine. The Vikings, even though they seem really annoying to negotiate with, apparently obnoxious to negotiate with, do pay their stars. So I don't think that this is a huge problem for Jefferson. I don't think it's a cause for angst for Vikings fans. And I think, yeah, we can get all the way down to it and talk about Jefferson's team first attitude or whatever, right? That might play a pretty big role too. He cares a lot about winning, but I think it's easy for him to care about winning because he doesn't have to care about money because that money's going to come and he's got a ton of it in endorsements. For, I would argue for too that Vikings fans, I would, I want to talk to people who are really like concerned about this. And I just ask if Justin Jefferson just signs an extension in March, will you be upset? Like, is there a reason that you would be upset about that? Maybe there is because maybe the price has gone up and you feel like that. And oh, maybe no. Be... They, Justin Jefferson earned a more accurate accounting of his market value. Uh, <laughs> right. Like, uh, maybe you're like, oh, they're approaching this mi moderately inefficiently. I think that would be a, a valid, if a little bit of a watered down critique. Uh, but the scenario where he ends up like, getting traded to Buffalo is just your PTSD talking like that's not yeah. real. And they have, they can literally sit on this for like three more years and not do it before it actually becomes an issue. Is, so... is the Jefferson trade to Buffalo in the room with us right now? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, the, the, the funny thing, and this is the narrative that we're going to start hearing. I think it's really stupid, but I know we're going to hear it is uh, when they are negotiating this next time, because they said they'll circle back after the season. Well, after the season, Kirk won't be a quarterback. So then it's going to become, well, J.D. doesn't want to sign if he doesn't know who the quarterback is. How does he not? He does, and he said he wanted to play with Cousins all that time. They let Cousins go, and they got Justin Jefferson traded. You're going to hear that take. Oh, and it's going to be bad. And Jefferson basically said, what was it, like a couple of days ago or something like that, that like, yeah, I don't know if Cousins is going to be here the whole time. Meh. <laughs> he's like i want it i like him but i can't yeah. control it and that's yeah i can't control I think it. when players and say, the background of that is that he's 35 it. right like i think jefferson is aware of that. There, there is a deeply midwestern thing going on that when when you hear someone say ah you can't control that that's usually them like lamenting that thing and i think that's kind of like a, a very point. like ah yeah. well can't control the weather kind of deal but when a player says well i can't control that they literally are just saying like well oh. yeah i would like it but hey that's not up to me like, right. That's not my and, job. I, and, and I and I don't want to speak for the person whose job that is like they're just trying to like be political. A, a lot of these a lot of these phrases need to be like in football adjusted terms. Yeah. Control what you can control is a football maxim. It's like a top three football saying in terms of the attitude that you need to take uh, towards football, especially in the NFL, where the NFL is a business. Oh, it's such a business like. Yeah, you can't control what you can't control. And it's, it's not I, like when your aunt says, well, you know, I, I wish you didn't marry her, but I, I can't control that. You know, like that's it's it's a not, different it's sentence. That. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a whole different sentence. <laughs> it, is your guys hunch on this that the Vikings are offering market value? No. And Justin Jefferson's camp, if, because of the historic nature of his accomplishments, want something... I, my Even like prestigious. Florio is to be believed, it, it was the Vikings that were the final ones that, to turn down an offer. That the ball was in their court, and they were the ones that said, "Let's circle back." At the end, my my hunch, and this is entirely based off of like tea leaf reading. This has nothing to do with like sources or anything like that. My hunch is that the Jefferson team is probably asking for slightly above market value, but is more likely asking for inflexibility in terms of guarantees and stuff like that. My mm -hmm. guess is that the Vikings are asking below market value, but not like dramatically below market value and not slightly below uh, market value either in order to lock in the benefits of getting a receiver deal done early. That's one of the only reasons that you negotiate a deal early is to get below market value for when that receiver eventually hits the market. So yeah, I think that's what mm -hmm. the Vikings are offering. And I think that there is something to be said about the Bosa deal, um, you know, kind of complicating things. But there's also something to be said about the fact that we haven't had enormous wide receiver deals uh, in, in 2022 or 2023. And so it, it was like Tyreek Hill 2021, I want to say. Uh, and yeah, so was, was it 2022? Um, I thought so, but I'm not going to Google it. Yeah, I'm 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 am done with this conversation basically after these sentences. So, but <laughs> <laughs> but like but like you know it, it's it's having another deal to uh, leapfrog off of that allows 
um, both sides to have an anchor point in the negotiations because they kind of don't have one. And so my hunch is that the Vikings offered uh, somewhat below market value. My hunch is that the the Jefferson's team offered not just above market value, but an inflexible guarantee structure. Uh, and um, both sides are like, yeah, okay, I guess, whatever. See you in March. I, I'm There's also another Florio thing on that. Um, and, you know, decide how reliable that narrator is for yourself. But he uh, posited it's, that it's, it's about so. the guarantee structure and that the Vikings. So if you look at like TJ Hawkinson's contract, he has some guarantees that are like rolling guarantees that haven't vested yet. And yeah. they vest the year that they would be paid out rather Ooh, than the old Steelman move. Yeah. Which yeah. would vest the year before they get paid out, making them functionally fully guaranteed. Cause you're not yes. going to cut that player that early into the contract. Uh, and, 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 and take so, on the dead hit of the guarantee from that year as well. Yeah, exactly. Right. So they would have to take on like, to, it, it makes those those dollars just very much yeah. functionally guaranteed and it just changes like the way the cash flow is paid out and there's like tax reasons to do it you don't have to care about um but with hawkinson's contract they vest like three days into the league year of that year like of 2026 the 2026 guarantees vest so they could theoretically cut him without him getting that money so it's not as functionally guaranteed and the the theory is if there is that Jefferson might have a problem with that and might want the other structure of rolling guarantees that are functionally guaranteed, but just like cash flow is is slightly different uh, for the organization. Hawkinson's finances. twenty. It says here that Hawkinson's twenty twenty five salary, which is currently guaranteed for injury, fully vests to a full guarantee in twenty twenty four. Oh, does it? What about the other one? Maybe I was just looking at the other one. Uh, twenty twenty six. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that one is a, so that one does vest in 2026. Okay. So it's one and one. Yeah. So if they're so, doing something similar there, he might have yeah. an issue. That might be like the yeah. sticking point here. Yeah. Cool. But yeah, I, if, if, if I were Jefferson, I would take functional guarantees over, um, a true rolling guarantee, which is the, the one that you just described. Um, but yeah, a functional guarantee through a rolling guarantee system that changes the cash flow for whatever reason um that's that like doesn't fine. mean anything to the player really like, yeah yeah I and mean, you get your money a little bit later and there's a time value of money aspect to it but unless sure. you're very serious about investing or you've got like a, a a very aggressive money manager it really doesn't matter especially again when jefferson has so many non-salary forms of income coming in yeah and he and might even sides, be immune it makes plenty of it makes plenty of sense for both sides to wait because they've got they've got mm -hmm. a lot like there's no reason to rush yeah. outside of being worried that like Jamar Chase will sign a big deal. And now that's going to make the price go up or whatever. And I was going to say like, they, maybe those two buddies are texting and have a plan as to how they can take advantage <laughs> together, together. together of this situation. Um, also so Jefferson cute. is yeah, that would be cool. probably in like 99% of injuries could, you know, could occur to him and he would probably still get paid a market setting rate. Like, I don't think there's a lot of injuries that are going to, to take that off the table. Um, well, maybe certainly a little bit, but I think that he's done enough and we've seen players come back um, from enough injuries that I don't think he would lose it all if he got hurt this year. And it depends on the injury, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. 99% yeah. of injuries. I think he comes back from makes the money. Um, yeah. There's always the occasional. Yeah. 1%. Um, but no, that's very that's very interesting, and I appreciate the debate, and uh, thank you guys. What a show. We'll be back on Thursday to talk more. Ron Johnson will join us then. Thank you, Arif. Thank you, Luke. It's the Minnesota Football Party and Locked on Sports Minnesota. Check out the Vikings postcast on, uh, on video on the Locked on Sports Minnesota channel or on the Locked on Vikings audio feed back next Thursday or this Thursday, three days from now. That's a game day. We're doing a game day show on Thursday. And uh, quickly, before we exit, the parlays did not go well. The parlays didn't go well for any of us. I was 0 for 2 on both legs, uh, Texans and Commanders, alternate line. Inman already lost because he didn't get Mostert, 50-plus rushing yards. Braun, Jefferson, anytime TD, did not hit. And uh, Arif, Chiefs minus 4.5, did not hit. 0-2, because uh, I also had the Bengals money line. You had the Bengals money line, and that went very badly. 
I think the only... And my so, reasoning was sound. Deshaun Watson is no longer good. Man, you would think that that was a safe one. <laughs> <laughs> there were a one. Not early couple. season Cincinnati is, uh, boy, that is a story. Yikes. Tough. It's tough. Survivor pool entrants were just mm-hmm. totally, yeah. Ruined hey, I, had, I had Washington in my survivor pool. They did enough. I'm just yeah. enough. Not 13 and a half points enough for me, but (laughs) they did enough to win. All right. So on Thursday, we'll make more ill-advised parlays and try to get back on a winning track for Arif, for Braun. I'm Sam Ekstrom. Thanks for watching the Minnesota Football Party.